Hi, this is To That Point, a podcast where we cover topics at the intersection of business and culture. I'm Jasmine Escher. I'm Montana Blair. We are so excited to officially launch the first theme in season one, the new college experience. More specifically, the new college experience in grad school. Over the next few weeks, we're talking to friends at prestigious universities who are pursuing master's degrees to get their take on whether or not a virtual master's program is worth it. MBA application rates have been declining over the last few years, even at top schools. Students are more reluctant to leave their jobs for two years to pursue an expensive degree, especially when tech giants like Google are offering competitive certificate programs that are cheaper and take less time to complete. Now, many of you are probably familiar with the MBA. It's drilled into all business folks that to get into a higher salary band and meet the right people, you've got to go to business school. This episode, we're learning about another option, the Harvard Graduate School of Design's MDE, a master's in design engineering. Hi, Pranitha. Hi, ladies. (laughs) (laughs) We're back. Good to talk to you so soon. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) So for everyone listening, uh, this is actually not the first time we have interviewed Pranitha. This is round number two. So there seems to be a little bit of development that's happened since we last spoke, (laughs) which is exciting. But for everyone who's listening to this for the first time, today we're talking to Pranitha Patil, first year MDE student at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Welcome, Pranitha. Welcome back. Thank you for having me again. I'm surprised you guys are willing to listen to me for another hour. (laughs) (laughs) Anytime. Many hours. (laughs) So again, just for everyone listening, I can explain how I know Pranitha. I met Pranitha in college. She was a junior when I was a freshman, and we met through the business school. And Pranitha has always been someone that I've really looked up to in terms of career trajectory. Spoiler, we both did quite a long stint at Accenture. (laughs) And yeah, just someone who I think makes really well thought out and cool decisions. So I'm really excited to hear again about your decision to do kind of a non-traditional route in grad school, or at least non-traditional for our peer group. We see so many people who do consulting go into an MBA program a few years in. And so to see you go to a design grad program, I think is really cool just given my interest. But I think a lot of other people would benefit from hearing about how you decided to make that decision and how you went away from the status quo. And I think it'll open up maybe an option that people haven't thought about. So I'll let you introduce yourself if there's anything else you wanted to add. Sure. No, I think you covered a lot of it. Thank you, Montana. I loved college. I loved our time at Business Council at UT in Austin in Texas. I think of that time very fondly. I would say, in addition to what you already introed, I spent a lot of time just thinking about the decision to go back to school in general, especially during a time, not just COVID, but just during this time where it feels like higher education might not be the answer if you do have a degree and you do have a lot of working experience. So that process for me took a while. I went back and forth for actually a couple of years before I made the decision to go back to school. And I'm currently in this, you know, phase where I don't exactly know what the the next year or two was going to hold, but I still look back on the process of applying and making the decision to apply fondly. And like, I felt like that was a good time for me to grow. So in addition to that, there's not much else that you have already covered. Well, actually, speaking of, we do have a couple of rapid fire questions that are not MBA related, not professional, just helps us get to know you a little bit better. So I'm just going to read them off, answer with the first thing that comes to mind. And there's only four. So no pressure. Um, First question, you walk into a coffee shop, it's the morning before you're headed to the office. Are you ordering iced or hot? Iced. What is the best tech newsletter that you're reading at the moment? Ooh, um, Med City News right now. Oh, that's a new one I actually haven't heard of. You'll have to send that to us. Sure. It's not super tech, it's just medical news, but it's good for healthcare startups. Anyways, more than one more than one word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last time we chatted, we asked you what your favorite airline was, and we were shocked to hear that it was United and not Delta as a Delta <laughs> loyalist. So as a follow-up question, do you prefer a window or aisle seat? Oh man, uh, depends on the time of the flight. So 
window if it's no it's aisle I'll just go with aisle I've changed yeah yeah I'm also an L seat sort of person I just like having the freedom to get up if I want to and like yeah. I usually don't get up during a flight but just in case I like to know that I can <laughs> yeah exactly okay and lastly where are you quarantined I'm currently in Cambridge I quarantined for most of it in New York in Brooklyn Got it. And for those of you that don't know, Cambridge is where Harvard University is. So yeah. we're going to hear a bit more about this, but Pranitha is actually on or near campus, which is nice due to the whole COVID virtual situation. Yes, it's been a blessing to be at least walking through here and meeting people on campus. Awesome. So I guess to kick us off, like I was saying earlier, A lot of us look into going into grad school. Um, It's a pretty big decision with a lot of different variables to consider. And having worked with you at Accenture and just the consulting realm, it's a natural next step for people to get an MBA. So it's really exciting and inspiring to see you take a bit of a different path. So the first question that we have for you is, why are you going to grad school and how did you rule out the MBA? I chose to go to grad school because I felt like after six years in strategy consulting, I needed more of a technical skill set. And the jobs that I wanted, I maybe could have gotten them right out of um, doing consulting, but I wanted to be able to, you know, kind of be selfish with my time and uh, my experience and spend a couple more years kind of digging into interest areas that I had in terms of just engineering and a little bit more of design. So I chose to go back to grad school because I found um, a few programs that I was interested in in a couple schools, especially with the intersection of design and engineering becoming more and more popular um, in the workplace. I felt like what more of a better time than to go back to school. Uh, And in terms of ruling out the MBA, as you mentioned, we both went to business school in in Texas. And I felt like an undergrad finance degree kind of taught me a lot about what business school would in terms of the knowledge. And I didn't feel like it was going to be worth it for me to go back to school purely for the network. Um, I wanted to come out with more of a technical skill set, as I I said. So yeah, I, I think nothing against MBAs. It just wasn't for me. And it felt like if I was going to go back and, and spend that money, I needed it to be worth it. So as a follow-up, I think something that I know I've personally struggled with and something that I see a lot of people debate is at what point in your career should you leave to go to grad school? I mean, I even know people who applied during undergrad and got in and decided to do like the two plus two program or whatever it's called. So you know way in advance that you're already going to go to grad school. And then you obviously see people who are in their 30s, 40s in grad school. So Where were you in your career when you decided to go and how did you make that decision? That's a great question. I definitely thought about it like within the first year of us being consultants. I was like, oh, I need to go back because that's just like what everyone's doing. And that feels like the cool thing to do. Uh, Two years of consulting and then out. Where was I when I actually decided that it might be a good choice? Um, Was more like four to five years into working. I really felt like, hey, you know what, this is the right time to take my GRE and potentially think about school because I've had this really great work experience. And I feel like I have something to contribute to class discussions, even just at the baseline, but also have more of a conviction and desire to like build more skill sets and like know exactly what I want to do after I come out of school. Um, Will that change? Totally, probably. Um, But I just felt like I had more experience in the working world um, to be able to make that decision with, with just like, yeah, just, just make that decision for myself. So, so that was, that was the reason that I chose to apply to school. And it felt like I maybe spent a little bit more time at my job than I might have wanted to. But I do think it was in the end, a good decision to, to take the time to really research the programs, to talk to people to make sure it was worth it, and then apply and ultimately decide to go. As a follow-up to that too, I'm curious, you know, in your decision-making process, how did you weigh just going to school? So like, I know I want to go to Mm -hmm. school no matter what, versus the programs that you're looking at and the schools that you were looking at. Like, did you think, if I don't get into Harvard Mm -hmm. or another top 
five school, I don't want to go? Or were you going to go regardless? Another really good question. I actually only applied to two schools and so luckily got into both. I I very much was very selective because the program is um, very niche and pretty new. Actually, this program that I'm in, Master's in Design Engineering, is only five years old. I knew that I had to go to one of the top schools to, again, make it worth it. I d- wasn't just going to go to get the degree on my resume. Like That's not at all why I'm here. So I think that, yeah, that, that was my decision-making process. It wasn't just like, I want to go back to school. I actually pushed that idea away from my head so long ago. I was like, oh, I, I just don't need school. But it was the like, compellingness of the program that made it worth it for me. Nice. And of course, you got into both of your top choices. I'm not surprised. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. That's so sweet. (laughs) And so I know the two that you did get into are obviously really great, but they also come with a really high and sometimes daunting price tag. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So would love to hear just how you rationalize that and how you made sense of the dollar amount. And then if you're comfortable with it, if you would talk about how you funded your degree. For sure. That's such a good question. And I know we briefly talked about it, but I'll just be super candid. My program is roughly $160,000 for two years for both of the schools I was looking at. That was the same cost. So once I made the decision to go to school, I knew this is going to be an investment in my career and my knowledge. And I kind of just like set that aside as this is what you're working for. Like I wasn't building a house right now. I'm working on my education and making that investment. So swallowing that pill was, was one thing. I think there's a whole host of things that we'll probably talk about in terms of like, is it worth it virtually, which we haven't gotten to, but yeah, it's still a factor that I keep in the back of my head because I'm fully self-funding it. I'm not taking student loans. I don't, there's no scholarships involved. And so I started saving like, I want to say three years ago, like really rigorously, um, and so I have just basically started investing all of my, most of my money, any of my savings in the market, which right now isn't super great, obviously, but I, I was like safe enough to be able to pay for school. Um, there's like a little bit at the end of the two years that I have a question mark on, but I'm lucky enough to say that my parents would be helpful if, if I needed them. So yeah, I'm fully funding it. It's something that I think goes untalked about that we should definitely talk about is if you are planning on going to grad school, starting to save as soon as possible is super important. And obviously there are ways that, you know, help you in terms of loans, but as much as you can save upfront, that is definitely the recommended option. Awesome. Congrats, by the way. I think that's really impressive. (laughs) The thought of fully funding a degree by myself is really daunting, but (laughs) it's good to hear that it's possible. Okay, so last technical question on like the mechanics of your program. Can you just explain what an MDE is? How did you find out about it and decide it was right for you? Yeah, MDE is a master's in design engineering. Specifically at Harvard, what that means is the design school and the engineering school that have collaborated to create this degree. There's a few programs out in the world and the U.S. specifically, like Stanford D School and a couple other programs in the U.S. that I looked at as well. Uh, The program is meant to really focus on systemic problems in the world and like understanding those problems, not necessarily building the solutions for them, but like how do you address the problem and then how might you build a solution? So we are, we do a lot of studio work. If you're familiar with the architecture programs, this is if it wasn't virtual, but we would be in a studio, we would be building physical things and products. We'd be learning, we're learning to code. We're learning software like Fusion 360, which is like 3D modeling so the the whole part of the degree is how do you, the first year is really thinking critically about problems that are in our society. The second year is all about your independent thesis, which is it could be a problem of your choice. And you you ultimately get, you know, advisors and a budget if if you can if you can travel. And so the program was so, so exciting to me because I was like, this is exactly like the skills that I want that I don't necessarily have from a consulting career. And so I found out about this actually through my friend who was in the program, former Accenture, and he just like in passing mentioned it. And I just kept it on my radar. And I went to the open house, did a lot of soul searching and ultimately decided to apply uh, once I talked to a couple of the students and it just felt like the right fit. Awesome. So to recap, you were a few years into your professional career at a consulting firm focused mostly on strategy. 
And you kind of took a step back and you said, mm, I've heard a few times that I should probably go to business school. Let me consider it again. And let me figure out what my options actually are. You said I could do the MBA. That's the most popular one. And you settled on this more unconventional program like Montana mentioned at the start that's more focused on design and is also a newer program. And you're also in your first year. So how how long has it been since the program started? Like a week, two weeks? Three, three, no, four weeks. Now, four, now we're in four, I think. We're in week four, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have four weeks under our belt, which is not a lot, but I feel like you have a lot that you've learned in that time so far. But all of that aside and kind of taking a little journey back in time to the beginning of the year. So you put in all of this hard work, you studied, you took your exams, you applied, you got in to two schools, which is incredible. And then in March, COVID hit. So in relation to that sort of pivot and like transitionary period that we've had as a collective global community where were you had you accepted the program were you still considering your options did it impact your decision at all oh yes uh 100 i got my acceptance like on march 5th and covid hit new york really badly like march 6th it felt like so i was celebrating for like two days and <laughs> then i was like okay well this you know co coronavirus is coming to new york and it feels like it's already here I just put, I didn't put the application, you know, away or not the application, the decision away. I was just like, okay, there's just like really big problem that we need to solve. Like, I don't know what's happening in the world. And so it 100% affected my decision. I feel like I just pivoted for a couple months. Like I, everybody just didn't know what was happening. And so, especially in New York, we just kind of hunkered down and I was like, oh, there's no way this is going to be a problem. Like in July, I'm sure the semester um, should I accept will be in person. I just didn't even think about it. And like a couple months go by and I'm like, okay, just kidding. This isn't going anywhere. I have to prepare for accepting this and knowing that it might be virtual. They hadn't really announced any decision yet. Like Harvard hadn't. So I accepted kind of not knowing whether or not it was going to be virtual, but in my head, really knowing that it was. And I went back and forth so, so much, like to be completely honest, it was like so much anxiety with that decision because you have no clue like what the next couple months look like. And in my head, I had already made the decision to leave Accenture and, and also not to recruit for a job, especially during Corona. And so I, I was just like mentally in the mindset of I want to be a student again. And I was getting so excited about it that I had to make that decision for myself pretty early on because it just wasn't good for my mental health to just keep toggling back and forth. Like, you're not going to go, you're going to go, you're not going to go. So ultimately made the decision to go and then was like, you know what, we're just going to make the most out of it. There's, there's like all these other people in terms of my cohort that will be doing the same thing. So let's just see how it goes. And I just took that risk and that bet at the time. So that was probably like end of summer that I, no, not actually end of summer, like July, August, that I had made the decision to go. And how did you and the other people within your cohort support each other? Or did you in this decision-making process, like were you guys all put in touch when you first got the acceptance and took and got admitted into the program? And was there a lot of back and forth between people on like, well, are are you guys still thinking of going? Like, do we pause? Like, what options were people considering? Totally. Yeah. So what's so funny is our program director sent an Excel sheet of all of the contact information. So I actually made a WhatsApp group for everyone, even though we didn't know each other. I was just like, I just, I can't just make this decision alone. And, you know, talking to friends and family uh, is just, is one thing, but like having someone else to talk to that's going through the exact same decision is exactly what we needed. So I made the WhatsApp group hoping that we would, you know, have the space to communicate with one another, another and feel like open and, you know, it's also so awkward because we don't know each other, right? So it's like, I am telling you all my feelings and and being super vulnerable on WhatsApp and like, you don't know who I am. And I mean, so much of the decision is personal. So we started off, I think with like 28 people, everybody was so nice on the route. And, you know, we tried to have a couple chats. I think most of us just reached out to each other one-on-one -on -one just to get to know one another and introduce each other. Ultimately, I think four people dropped 
they were all international students, which honestly makes so much sense. And we were like, I, I, I mean, I remember asking the question like, Hey guys, I know we're coming up on like a cup, like a couple months, couple days before decisions. Like, what is everyone going to do? And people were actually really, really open and open with their communication and feelings and thoughts. And that really helped, I think, because I was like, this is how I'm feeling. And this is what I am going through. And this is a really hard decision to make. So having that community was really nice. And now that I actually know them and, and, you know, fast forward a couple months, I can just tell that honestly, the cohort is what makes the program. I know everybody says that about any organization that they love, but they've just been like the best group of people to be going through this with because everybody just has such a level head and just like brilliant mind. So that's been really nice. Yeah, it makes me think of that super popular saying, there's strength in numbers. I think when you're going through something alone, especially if it's a challenging decision, it's so easy to doubt yourself and say, this is not the right thing or say, this is not the way that I should have done it. But it seems like you're building a lot of camaraderie and that you were even able to do so before the program started. So being able to have these really strong relationships with people that you're going to be working alongside with over the next two years is great. And I'm just curious, what role did Harvard play in helping to facilitate this decision pre-program start date? That's a good question. So I (laughs) don't have like the best things to say, which is fine. I'm being super candid. So we actually, a group of us just within the whole arc of the design school, not just my program, we decided to write a letter, um, come together, get all these signatures specifically. I mean, we're paying, you know, full tuition for a virtual semester that, j- that just didn't feel right. Um, and I'm sure that you've, you all, you both have heard just like the news of higher ed and all of that in terms of pricing and how, how are they doing that? What are they taking test scores away? There's just been like this whole you know, conversation around that, especially right before the start of the semester. So we were part of that. Like we were part of one of those groups that tried to basically petition for, you know, either lower tuition or another option just to be included in the conversations that and the decisions that were being made at the leadership level of the school. And if I'm being super candid, it wasn't really clear to us. Like they were, they had already made some of these decisions and there was just like no room for, you know, adjustment on their part. And so we kind of, the thing about schools and especially ones that have, you know, the Ivy League name to them is they are at the end of the end of the day, they are a business and they have the luxury of saying, you know, students are still going to come to our school because of the name and the brand. And honestly, like I, I did that, right? Like I didn't, I, even though I was so gung ho about writing that letter and just making my, my voice uh, heard, I still ultimately chose to come and 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 place that bet in a school. So I think that's how a lot of my peers felt. It was it was like, okay, well, I got in here and there's a reason I'm going here. So there, it, it, I don't know if that makes sense. It's just it was a hard, a really hard decision to make, and I wouldn't say that they were the most comforting or just like they weren't listening to us basically, uh, in in terms of the decision making process and like helping guide us into the fall semester at a leadership level. Yeah, it's almost a question of if I'm still dropping 160k on this degree, yeah. is the name of Harvard on my resume strong enough to stand for itself and is that as important or more important just given the current situation as my ability to actually learn and grow in my skills? Yeah. And this is probably a separate conversation, but I think the way that the hiring process has changed as well is like, is there less emphasis on an MBA, on the school name? Like yeah. all of that is also becoming so unique to the company where you're trying to get hired. So I find that's always like a very interesting point that you're kind of forced to consider. And that was all pre-start date. So now that you're four weeks in, I think the headlines that we've seen throughout COVID has been just like innovation, innovation, innovation. It's like a mandated push towards digital. Mm -hmm. And you can see all of these different industries that are starting to adjust to what will eventually be a post-pandemic world where a model of a professor lecturing in front of a blackboard 
can and should change as well. Mm -hmm. And you have industries like fitness where Peloton is saying you don't need anything but a bike and a screen to get fit or medicine where I can now like have a Zoom call with my doctor and he can diagnose me and prescribe me something right then and there or even like being able to stream concerts on Fortnite. So (laughs) there's all of these really interesting things happening that are really just helping us zone in on our screens. But I've seen over and over again that this is not resonating in online learning. Mm -hmm. Like the online learning situation is just not working for people, especially in higher education. And like you mentioned, I think it's because there's so much emphasis on network And the value that you get out of it is not as tangible as like learning geometry, for example. So how has Harvard handled taking the program remote in terms of helping you still access these networks or access these unique learning opportunities? It's a really good question. I I think so. The one I know I just like mentioned how leadership was not like supportive before we got here. The one thing I know that they were working on And that was probably where their focus should be was, you know, this transition. So March, when March happened, professors had to go online within like a weekend, you know, so that was insane to just think about that transition versus the time in the summer that they had. They used the summer to get comfortable with Zoom, to get comfortable with breakout rooms, to get comfortable with playing music before a call or before class starts. Like they spent the time in the summer to prep for that. I will say that that was that is something that happened because it doesn't just happen overnight, particularly when you do have not just, not like older people don't know how to use technology, but professors who just aren't used to talking to a screen when walking through you know, an equation for students just at the baseline, transitioning that to online is so challenging. So it is difficult for everyone, right? It's difficult for the professor. It's difficult for the TA. It's difficult for this new student who has been in a job for six years and like moving to online learning, it's so hard for everyone. So I do want to acknowledge that. I would say though, it's just been like a pull, 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 like on both ends. And we just haven't been able to find this happy medium. The one, the one thing is they've been open to feedback uh, in terms of like on a daily basis that we give it. And, And professors in my program, to be completely honest, they've been super good about feedback. It's just about how, that resonates and that, you know, that transition from a studio like environment to online. Like if you think about that jump, it just doesn't work well, right? Because studio is not, is all about in-person learning and, and leaning over to your teammate who knows how to build something in Fusion 360 and say, you know how, do you know how to make this? Because I don't. If you don't have that opportunity to do that, you're spending like four more hours on YouTube videos learning yourself versus if I just asked someone next to me, the question would be answered in like two minutes. So that like that's what feels stunted in terms of my ability to learn. It's not that I'm incapable of learning. It's that I don't have the ability to turn and ask my friend or my professor. And that that learning journey is just like so much, so much more isolating. And I think that's what's really driving all of us insane is you have three monitors on your desk, you have YouTube open, but you know that like, you shouldn't be doing you should not be learning this way. I don't think any student should be learning this way, um, like from kindergarten to grad school. So that's, I think what we're all really struggling with is because our program is so physical, like so dependent on physical spaces and physical material, doing that alone in your in a small studio just isn't ideal. So because we have the luxury of having this is like a follow up to the original conversation that we had. Yeah. I know that you had a studio like prototype based project that you've had to do um, since the last time that we talked. Mm -hmm. Could you just explain like how that went and how you tried to accomplish that while in Cambridge with the other people who were there and like what the people who are doing who aren't on campus yet and then maybe how that experience has informed your plan for the future? Yes, such a good follow up question. So I'm lucky enough that I have a team, my team was assigned and my team is in Cambridge. So we actually are building something for diabetic foot ulcers. And we are trying to we're in the prototyping phase, basically trying to build a product that would allow a patient to manage their ulcer. And long story short, 
we ended up spending like nine hours on Sunday at one of my teammates apartment. And to be honest, like nine hours went by so fast because we were, you know, building things and then we would take a break and go on and build something on one of our computers. The other person would be drawing. Like it was the process of studio that we just like made at his apartment. And we like made a studio out of his office basically. And that was so nice. Like that was one of the things that I was like, Oh my gosh, this is what, you know, this is what I'm looking forward to. And this is what I'm paying for. But in a room where I have access to all these materials, right? Like luckily he had got gone and got modeling clay and foam boards and stuff that we could use because he's a former architect. So like he knew, he knows what the studio environment is like. And a lot of us don't. So I am so lucky to say that I had that opportunity to like go to someone's apartment, build something there, build a physical clay model of our device that we're trying to build. But then if you take that and you look at someone who, someone else's team who's on three different time zones, Canada, Cambridge, and China, that's not the same experience. Like they had to draw individually, share things on Miro and like other online collaboration tools take pictures and then like cobble something together, right? Because it's three different experiences. You don't even physically get to hold something. So that has just been like so telling, right? It's like, I'm just lucky because my team is here, but like my next project isn't, that's not guaranteed. And also just the experience of it for, for everyone. It's like, we had to do, we have to do all this like front loading effort on behalf of the students to get materials and, you know, build that space for ourselves versus, having the studio on campus that has all these materials that, that has engineers that know how to 3d print we don't we don't have any of that so we're having to just upscale ourselves which sure is a good learning thing but it's not like what i should be spending hours in the evening doing right it should be like i know i can turn to someone and then i learn it and then i move on to my next assignment so that was really long-winded but yeah that's how that process went and i do feel like i just got lucky to have a team that's all here Yeah. And it seems like you've done well in getting creative on getting together with the other students in your program. Have you been able to do the same with the professors or the TAs? Like, are they also accessible or nearby or having in-person or virtual office hours? How are you building that network? That's a, a, a good question. Yeah. The professors who are in Cambridge One of them has been really awesome about just doing like Saturday morning office hours behind one of the buildings and everybody's wearing a mask, which is really nice. Other people just have online office hours that they say like sign up for the slot and you'll be like let into my Zoom room, which is great. I think that's awesome that they're super available for us. I will say though that it just feels really formal when you do something like that, right? Like it's not, let me just drop into this person's office, say hello and like have this informal chat versus when you have to sign up and there's a process and you're led into a room, it just feels much more formal. And so I do think I'm getting the formal connections with my professors because I'm kind of being really adamant about that. But I I think there's this like inherent lack of informal connection that's sometimes more important than the formal connection, especially between a professor, researcher and a student that I feel like that's what I'm craving and I'm, I'm not getting. Yeah, absolutely. And I I was actually wondering, what was your expectation on the sort of network that you were going to be able to build coming into the program? And how does that compare to, granted, I know you're four weeks in, you you have had a couple of months of like (laughs) chatting with people and getting to know the other people in your cohort, but does it match the expectation you had? And I ask only because such a big part of the allure of an MBA is the network. Like I hear it day in and day out. If you want to know the right people to get you to where you want to be, go to B school. So do you feel like you're still getting that experience of an MBA? I definitely hear that the network part of an MBA, I, I was like, Oh, it's fine. Cause I mean, obviously I chose not to do an MBA and I was like, it's fine if I don't get this same level of networking, even though I know I'll get some network with the MDE program, right? So I, I I went in knowing that it would be a little bit different. I think my expectations were I am because I'm going to be spending so much time with my cohort and, and the professors in the design school and engineering school, I want to focus on other schools and like other areas that I'm interested in, like the Kennedy School here, or or the or you know, there's like so many different amazing professors and research 
like researchers here. So I wanted to expand out of that. And obviously virtually that's really hard because they're just, they only know you by an email address. And so I've just been trying to do that through other professors. So right now that's one thing that's like complicated. And I I feel like my expectations are not being met because I don't have access to those professors. And I again, can't just walk into their office during office hours. The second piece is just networking for jobs. There are so many places where you can just like go to a career fair and or go to the career center in a normal world and just walk in and say, hey, I'm this student from the design school and I have my resume and I just want to sign up for this. And like usually they're okay with that. Right now though, that is completely not available, right? So those portals online are just locked to specific schools. And so if you want a job, like if you want to go to access you know, Harvard Business School's recruiting services, you could potentially do that in person. But now you, that's not even an option because they're just trying to k- take care of business school students at this moment. So that is something that I haven't fully felt the brunt of yet because I haven't fully been in recruiting mode, but I know it's coming. And that's like the, probably going to be the most frustrating part is I'm paying all this money. I don't even get to access like three fourths of the recruiting platforms. And that's like the biggest bummer in the world because so much of, you know, the Harvard network is like people outside of your program too. And I feel like I'm not getting that access. So I think that's a good segue into kind of post-grad plans. And I know we talked last time about, you know, some of the options available to students who get an MDE. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear that again. But also just knowing you, like I know you'll make the best of the situation and you have so many opportunities available to you. Like you were definitely Accenture famous, (laughs) as they say. So I'm sure you could go back. You are. (laughs) Pranitha, for everyone listening, Pranitha is very well known in the healthcare strategy group at Accenture. Oh, <laughs> but like you could go back and do that, I'm sure, like as a, you know, backup plan if that's not what you wanted to do, or you could find a new job, or I've heard and we've heard in some other interviews that people are potentially turning more to entrepreneurial paths just because of how strange the recruiting landscape might be. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the options that you're looking at and your peers are looking at? And do you have any just initial hunches of where you would want to go? It's like spot on to how I'm thinking. So, I mean, all the things you mentioned are are kind of, my head's going all over the place. In terms of like in an ideal world after MDE, jobs are basically kind of a build your own type of path here. So you can, you can kind of do whatever you want and get a really amazing job because the people that come into this program have such cool backgrounds and, and kind of build and shape exactly what they want in this beautiful way. In terms of things that I was looking at, and I'm still really interested in is like more of the product route. I I don't have any product experience, but I do want to explore if that's something of interest to me. I don't want to just like jump on the product bandwagon just because everybody is talking about it. But I do want to see if that is of interest is particularly in the healthcare startup space. So that's something I'm still very interested in, whether that happens next year or the following year or three years from now, I don't know. But that that's that's something I definitely want to try out. I think thinking about going back to Accenture has come up in the past week as an option. Do I necessarily want to do that? Not really, uh, just because I, I have not been away long enough. But if it comes down to it, like that's that's obviously not a bad option. And I'd be so lucky to say that I could go back to a job, you know, that's not I'm not complaining by any means. But then the other path is exactly what you said. It's like, should I start something with a couple of my peers? And like, do we take a leave of absence next year and, you know, try something out? That is also potential, right? Everything is kind of open right now. And I wouldn't say I'm committed in one way or the other. It's just such a weird time and decisions are not easy to make, but it's also like, it's a weird time for everyone. So how do I make the most of of this opportunity? And like the people that I've met here, I just, I don't, I don't want to leave them. If that makes sense. I feel very tied to, to the people that I met and I do want to just like cherish and build on those relationships. So I feel like the entrepreneur route and staying in Boston is like where my head is at right now on this Wednesday afternoon or evening. It might change tomorrow. So yeah, that that's kind of where my brain space has been the past couple of days. Yeah, that's exciting. You definitely have a lot of options, which is a big blessing in a time like this. Yes, it is. <laughs> so 
also something that I wanted to make sure we touched on, just knowing you and knowing how many different social causes you know about and care about. Which of those are you hoping to examine further, either through the program and this new way of thinking through systems or potentially through something entrepreneurial that you do with your peers? I definitely want to stay in the healthcare route. I have this love for women's health. I don't know in what capacity just yet, but whether it's women's health in the US or abroad, specifically new moms, I think that's a space that always needs more attention and also just it has just been underserved. So, so women's health. And then another area that I'm interested in that I've just been dabbling with is the prison system in the US and healthcare related to women in prison. There's a lot of just baseline, there's a lot of healthcare that is missed in terms of addressing women's needs and women generally need to see, be seen more often and particularly in prison systems in the U.S. that is just not there. So I would, I would love to explore that space because you tie, you know, you tie every everything wrong in our system in the U.S. is like prison and homelessness. And like that's just like because of the history of the system of the United States and, and like everything going wrong. That's why people end up in prison. So that's just like a space, this fascinating space to me. And I just have no clue. I feel like I know like maybe 0.1% of everything happening there. Um, so I, I would be so excited to, to look into that space more and spend more time addressing, you know, even just one problem within that um, system. Yeah, I'm really excited to watch and see which facet of it you pick to tackle first. <laughs> That'll be really cool to watch. So to close us out, I guess, very selfishly for me, since I always <laughs> watch what you do and take advice from it, but also for our listeners, what advice do you have to other young strategists and creatives who are thinking about a career shift, thinking about grad school? What would you maybe have told your analyst self or what would you have told yourself even a few months ago? Yeah, it's a good one. Advice might not be the right word, but what I would have done and what I encourage other people. So yeah, advice. What I encourage people to do in general is one, your day job is your day job. And that's great if you love it or you hate it. But I also think you should spend time doing side projects. And especially now that you know traditional CVs are going out of being used, building a portfolio is so important. So spend time doing other side projects on things that you're interested in and learning them online because why not you have time if you're doing something on a new platform. So side projects are something that I wish I did more of. Second is just reaching out to people. I think we often forget to reach out to people after we get our first job and, and like until we're recruiting for our next job. We're not constantly talking to people. And I need to do more of this myself is like look at whatever forum you look at. Uh, in terms of the job you want and just reach out to them and more than likely they'll respond and you can have a conversation with them. I think there's a beauty in that that I, I myself don't take advantage of. And then when I do, I'm like, oh my gosh, I should do one of these conversations like every week. So those two things I think are, are very important. And the third I would say is just save your money because we have no clue when the next pandemic is happening or when you're going to lose your job. And I just feel like that's something that I mean, I wasn't doing three years ago or four years ago before I decided to go to grad school. I wasn't saving enough. And I think that that is so, so important, especially women. We just don't talk about it enough, I think, in, in our peer groups and our in our girlfriend groups. And I just want to do more of that. So that's a big one. It's like learn about the market and then invest in the market because the guys that you're talking to are definitely doing that. So that's something I've just been like harping on lately. Those three things and I'll stop because I'm not a guru it, by any means. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. And I think in a, a dream world, maybe post-COVID, something that Jasmine and I would love to do is to take whatever to that point is and make it like IRL and have some of these conversations. Like mm -hmm. I imagine it as a supper club or something with people who meet once a month and actually talk through these things, because I know I have so much to learn from you and some of our other friends who are really you know, well read into personal finance and investing. And I totally hear you on the portfolio side of things too. Like as a strategist, how do you build a portfolio? It looks really different than someone who's already a product designer and has something much more visual to share. So just like pushing each other to figure out what that looks like and, you know, constantly keep up. So I think those are awesome pieces of advice. 
Thanks for tuning in. To That Point is created and produced by us, Montana and Jasmine. Big thanks to Levi Barry for the audio engineering and editing. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, leave a review, and follow along on Instagram at To That Point. See you soon.